Well, I said it first service, I'll say it again. I love the music here. Just love it. I'm so grateful for the music. Thank you. And this song, this song we just sang, the words, unfailing love. Psalm 13 says, but I trust in your unfailing love. Again and again, the Psalms we read this. What a great time of a year it is. Have you ever wondered whether the small things you do for Christ have impact? I'd like you to keep that question in mind as we read the scripture today, which is found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 32. Let's read this parable of Jesus. Jesus told him another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. Let's turn to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you, thank you for this word, and we pray, oh Lord, that you would come here now, into this place, uh, even as you've been here already, as we've sung and praised you, you've been here, but Lord, make us aware of you, speaking to our hearts, reminding us of this word, and applying it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I've got to admit that of all the festivals of the year, Thanksgiving for me is right up there near the top. I, I love the fellowship, the family, the food. I love the fall decorations Julie puts up. And uh, I even like the turkey jokes. You know, uh, I read one uh, just the other day. Why did the cross turkey cross the road twice? To prove he wasn't a chicken. Uh, I even like the turkey jokes my kids used to tell about me. I think I still have a card, either uh, illustrated by my daughter Olivia or my son Robin, um, personally illustrated with the turkey. And it turns out the turkey coming to dinner it was me, their dad. I love, I love that we can do that. And, uh, or, or this one. Dude, I have a ton of online followers and they all want to have me over for dinner. <laughs> They're mod they get more and more modern as time goes on. But uh, most of all, I just like the idea. The idea of it. Giving Thanks. The fact that millions of Americans have that in mind, even if they don't actually do it. Is wonderful. Thank you. That's quite a gift. That little band of pilgrims have left us. When you think about Thanksgiving small beginnings, however, you've got to admit there's something astonishing about it, isn't there? I mean, if you were one of the original pilgrims at that meal shared one October day in 1621, nearly 400 years ago, who among you would have thought that one day your meal would be celebrated by hundreds of millions. You know, it, it wasn't a very glorious time. Of the 102 original passengers on the Mayflower, over half died within the first two months of their arrival. 
Over half and half the crew. By the time disease and starvation had done their work, only 47 settlers remained. Most died on board their ship where they were huddled for warmth near the tip of Cape Cod as they waited out the winter. During the worst of the sickness, six or seven settlers took care of all the rest. How would you like to survive with a memory of that as you prepared a meal to celebrate your first harvest? Think about it. Fear of sickness, fear of attack, fear of cold, a wilderness, huge grief. Wouldn't you wonder whether all you had done was even worth it? Not everything, of course, was unremittingly bad. Many of us know the story of Squanto, a Native American Indian. When the remaining settlers made it to shore in March of 1621, their, to their astonishment, they were met and greeted in English, first by an Apanaki Indian, and then a short time later with a member of the Patuxet tribe who spoke fluent English named Squanto. Squanto, a shortened version of Disquantum, befriended the pilgrims and showed them how to plant crops that would survive in the New World. He also helped them enter into peace negotiations with the local tribe, the Wampanoags. It was that chief's tribe's chief, Massasoit, who accepted their invitation, arrived with other members of his tribe to celebrate a successful harvest that fall. The Wampanoags were twice as numerous as the settlers at that meal, fortunately. They brought along with them five deer. No sweet cakes or pecan pies, the supply of sugar from maple trees had already dwindled. But, for those who love traditional Thanksgiving meals, Edward Winslow, one of the settlers in a letter which was preserved into the 19th century, tells us that wild turkey was hunted just before the meal. And we can guess that other dishes were wild swan, goose, duck, flint corn, squash, porridge, beans, chestnuts, and shellfish. Which is all fascinating in itself. But the real surprise is that this meal has made its way into our collective memory at all, considering the miserable circumstances that gave birth to it. Why this particular meal in 1621? Harvest festivals, after all, have been celebrated for centuries around the world and still are. The Old Testament commanded a celebration called the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Tabernacles to celebrate not only the harvest but the desert wanderings of the Israelites upon leaving Egypt to settle in a new land. This first Thanksgiving of the pilgrims was probably an echo of that celebration. Ten years after that event, the Puritans arrived in Massachusetts, led by John Winthrop, some 700 strong, and celebrated their first Thanksgiving meal after a harvest in 1630. The settlers of Jamestown for the south in Virginia had already done the same several years before. The Continental Congress during the War for Independence designated one or more days of Thanksgiving a year. And George Washington and his army stopped in freezing weather outside Valley Forge to observe the first Thanksgiving of the new United States of America. 
that it was Abraham Lincoln who finally heeded the letter writing campaign of some 36 years by a writer named Sarah Josepha Hale asking for a day of national thanksgiving. He granted it a short time after Gettysburg at the height of the Civil War designating the fourth Thursday of Thursday. Lincoln could have named any of those previous celebrations as the origin of the feast. But it was the celebration of that little group of 47 grief-stricken settlers and 90 Native Americans in 1621, which the nation remembers. Who would have imagined it at the time? Such a painful, small beginning with such huge repercussions. If you asked them, they probably would have told you it was something they always did. They were just carrying on their faith as usual, giving thanks, giving back to God, trying to get along with their Native American neighbors. Just doing what their faith required. To them it would have been normal to have this. Thanksgiving meal. And to invite their Indian neighbors. Albeit bittersweet to the deaths of their loved ones. Hanging heavily on their minds. Who would have thought that what they did would be remembered to this day by hundreds of millions? Such a small mustard seed with such huge results. Now I want to ask you this question again. Have you ever wondered whether the faithful things you do have any real impact? Things you do simply because you believe? Many of you have gone through loss and suffering. You may be tempted to pack up and stop serving God. It seems anyway so unimportant what you do. But truthfully, you have no idea That thought really struck me a month ago or so when Julie and I were invited to return to Paris. As many of you know, I worked in Paris for 11 years before moving to southwest France to begin church planting for eight. It was in Paris that Julie and I met and married 30 years ago. So it was something of a God sighting when out of the blue came an invitation from a pastor I had not seen or heard from for 27 years to come and preach at the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Mother Church to his own. So there we were in Paris, where we had been married, the day before our anniversary, celebrating. Now that's a God thing. But the astonishing thing to me was the pastor's insistence that he had come to Christ at a weekend retreat for which I was the speaker. Now, I just need to tell you something about that. You have no idea how small I felt as a native, non-native French speaker learning to speak French in a sophisticated culture where I did not share other people's public school education college experience or seminary experience in French. I wasn't felt like a transplant, always feeling kind of inferior. Despite the goodness of those French people toward me and they loved me. 
It's hard crossing linguistic and cultural lines. You often feel very small. Think of our missionaries and pray for them. So when I was invited by a Chinese church in Paris to speak to a nascent French-speaking branch of their church, their young people needed the services in French because they'd grown up there. That was another stretch. I'd go on Sunday afternoons to this Chinese church and preach and began doing camps for their young people in the summer, something on the side to my regular work, kind of like bringing a team to the Czech Republic or to Roatan or Colombia. At the time, I had no idea of the impact I was making. I can't even remember what I talked about. Probably a common experience of yours as you try to remember what I say on Sunday mornings. <laughs> And here was this young man named Pascal at the first camp I did for this church, forced to attend by his grandmother, having just moved to Paris from Toulouse, peppering me with questions. After answering what questions I could after one of the sessions, I, I felt led to say to him, Pascal, I might not be able to answer all your questions, but I want you to know one thing. Jesus loves you. And that was it. That's what he heard. That's what changed his life. That one simple question. And now he's the first Chinese pastor of a French-speaking Chinese church in France with some 200, 200, 250 members. You never know how significant what you do in Christ's name turns out to be. Sometimes it's something that seems very small indeed. Now some of you may be saying to yourself, yeah, but you're a missionary in France and a pastor. I could never do that. That's huge. True. My response to you is nevertheless, you can turn to someone asking questions about God and say very simply to them, I can't answer all your questions, but this thing I know, Jesus loves you. Can't you? And like a tiny mustard seed, that question can grow into something far beyond anything you imagined. After preaching in that church on October 7, a week later, Julie and I showed up at the French church I'd worked at for 11 years in Paris called Alasia. Aside from the joy of seeing so many old friends, I had a, another head-spinning experience. At the end of the service, a lady turned around. She was seated directly in front of me and greeted me enthusiastically. She said, Carl, you may not remember me, but you visited me in the hospital when my first child was born, and I prayed for him that he become, a, and you prayed for him that he become a servant of God, and now he is. I think of your prayer all the time. You know, I'm embarrassed to say, I don't even remember this lady, no. or the visit. Yet for her, it was life changing. We have no idea how the small things we do in Christ's name impact others and have repercussions far beyond what we imagine. Do you know how important your prayers with another person can be? When a neighbor is sharing with you a grief or a problem, have you ever thought of turning to them and saying, I don't know whether you're a believer, but I find that prayer helps. Could I pray with you? My wife, Julie, grew up in a non-church-going family. 
believe they talked much about God, if at all. But Julie gave her life to Christ in her teens, and after completing her studies at the university, she did further training at Cape and Ray Bible School to prepare for mission work. Later, following God's call to serve in France. And one day when she was in her 20s, her mother mentioned to her that she, Julie, had been born in a Salvation Army hospital. And every day, the nurses would pray over the babies. Her mother said to her, I've often wondered if that is why you became so religious. Well, you know, it's altogether possible. Her mother was right. And if she was, can you begin to get a picture of the impact your prayers are having on others? You may think your service in Christ's name is insignificant. Think again. This last week, there was a memorial service for Jean Dudley, who was a member here for decades. Jean led others into the church, went on mission trips, and had an impact on countless youth, both inside the church and out, during his years as a teacher and school counselor. Do you know that Jean grew up never attending church and in massive poverty? Do you know how he came into the church? One day, a young sixth grade student of his named Kay Tawning approached him and asked him, why don't you go to church, Mr. Dudley? And because of that question, and wanting to be the role model for youth that he had never had as a boy, he walked through the doors of Westside and was led to Christ. One simple question by an 11-year-old girl, and that man's life was changed forever. And today, he's celebrating in heaven. What you do matters. No matter how small you think it is. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 42, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. If a cup of cold water is important to Christ, think how much prayer or sharing a meal or visiting the sick or teaching or tutoring in ESL or teaching Sunday school or working as a deacon is significant to Christ. Just a mustard seed of faith, Jesus said. One of my favorite stories from Alpha comes from a talk called Why and How Should I Tell Others? It's a true story from World War I. A British soldier in the trenches has just been shot and is dying. Another soldier comes to his side and asks him if there's anything he can do for him. If there's anyone he can bring a message to back home. The man says, yes. Go and see so-and-so at such and such an address and tell him that what he taught me years ago in Sunday school is helping me to die now. And that's what the fellow soldier does. He finds the man and tells him, and the man exclaims, God, forgive me. I stopped teaching Sunday school years ago because I didn't think that it made any difference. Never underestimate what you do 
in Jesus' name. Did Squanto know when he came and helped these English settlers in the depth of their despair? Apparently he had learned forgiveness because depending upon whom you read, some 7 to 13 years previous he had been abducted along with 25 others and taken from his home near Cape Cod. When an English ship anchored off the coast trading in fish and furs kidnapped them. The ship crossed the ocean to Spain where most of the Indians were sold in Malaga. Of this group of men, a number were purchased by monks who were intent on instructing them in the Christian faith. One of these might well have been Squanto. If so, did the monks know what kind of repercussions their act of kindness would have? Somehow Squanto made his way to England and spent years in the household of one John Slaney, a wealthy merchant with interest in a royal grant in the New World, who later sent him back over the Atlantic with John Smith, first to Newfoundland and later to Massachusetts. When Squanto arrived, he discovered that his whole tribe had been wiped out by disease. Actually, this was true for some 200 miles along the coast. In time, Squanto became a skillful translator and negotiator, both for the Wampanoags, among whom he came to live, and with the settlers he was soon to meet. It was in Plymouth Bay in March 1621 that, sent as an emissary by this tribe, he would befriend grieving religious refugees, trying to figure out how to survive and cultivate the siege which they had found in native graves. He would show them where and how to fish, how to stamp on the mud along rivers to find fat edible eels, how to build little mounds of earth and bury first a kernel of corn with a fish for fertilizer and then once the corn had sprouted, to plant beans in the same mounds whose runners would subsequently use the corn stalks as poles. And then how to plant squash on the ground around the corn and beans to replenish the soil and keep out the weeds. There may be a reason pumpkins are a part of our celebration. Does Guanto know what repercussions his small acts of kindness would have down through the years? Because he reached out to this handful of immigrants to his land? When he died a few years later of fever, the governor of the colony, William Bradford, grievously mourned the loss of his friend. At Squanto's dying request, Bradford prayed for him that he would find his way to Jesus' heavenly kingdom. Another small prayer with huge consequences. Sometimes our lives seem so insignificant. We feel we've done so little. We look out over the wreckage and suffering around us and are tempted to think that little of worth remains. How wrong we are. Jesus sees it all. Every act of love, every word of kindness, every prayer of faith and trust, he sees and hears it all. And what he plants in and through us, like that tiny mustard seed in the parable, grows up and becomes a place of refuge for people we don't even know. That is why Paul writes in Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I think it's appropriate to close with these 
Words penned by John Bunyan, the writer of Pilgrim's Progress, some 60 years after the founding of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Words are immortalized in a hymn. Who would valiant be against all disaster? Let him in constancy follow the master. There is no discouragement shall make him once relent his first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. Since, Lord, thou dost defend us with thy spirit, we know we at the end shall life inherit. Then fancies flee away. I'll fear not what men say. I'll labor night and day to be a pilgrim. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that the power comes from you. You infuse our small acts of faith with your power. And you make that seed grow. And you make it fruitful. Not us. What you look for from us is faith and constancy, the determination to follow on. And so we ask, Lord, you'd give us the strength to continue our pilgrimage and journey to the end with our eyes fixed on the heavenly sea, knowing that we are pilgrims and heading to that land where one day we will see you face to face. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.